Did you know that Autodesk had its own game engine that you probably haven't heard of? As you might expect, they didn't make it themselves from scratch. Of course they didn't. They acquired it from a promising company and added it to their own set of tools. Initially, it kinda had a promising start, but over time, it faced challenges that led to its eventual demise. This is the story of the rise and fall of Stingray. This all started when Autodesk acquired the Swedish BitSquid engine in 2014, and they rebranded it as Stingray, aiming to offer an in-house game engine that hopefully was gonna be integrated with popular 3D software, where artists could create assets in Maya or Max, for example, and see them instantly in-game. In a control demo, Autodesk showed that making or modifying a 3D asset in Maya could have it appeared almost instantly in Stingray, thanks to the live link between these DCC tools and the game engine itself. The seamless workflow was kind of meant to simplify collaboration, so anyone on a game development team, like an artist, animator, or texturing artist, should be able to preview their work simply and in near real time. You see, Autodesk's goal was to round out its game development suite by adding a game engine to its arsenal of modeling, animation, and middleware tools. By doing so, Autodesk hoped to keep game studios within its ecosystem from content creation throughout making the final game, reducing the need for third-party engines, which I would say is a challenge to say the least. The company pitched Stingray as a professional-grade engine for both AAA studios and indie developers, talking about things like emphasizing intuitive, modern tools to bring graphically advanced games to the market in a wider range of platforms. But this wasn't everything. Stingray was also promoted for users beyond games, as we have seen with engines such as Unity and Unreal. Autodesk demonstrated how architects and engineers could use Stingray to turn Revit building models into interactive, real-time 3D visualizations and VR walkthroughs with minimal effort. Stingray debuted at GDC of 2015 to considerable interest, especially among existing Autodesk customers. Early adopters included studios already familiar with BitSquid. For example, Fetchark announced it was using the new Stingray engine for Warhammer Inc. Times, and Arrowhead Game Studios had previously shipped titles like Helldivers, All the BitSquid, and Stingray Tech. This gave Stingray a measure of credibility at launch, indicating it was production proven in real games. Overall, the engine got some traction and was used by a number of small and big game studios. Plus, it has some great VR features. Developers praised Stingray's clean, streamlined editor interface and strong out-of-the-box toolset. In fact, a 2016 review highlighted that the UI was incredibly streamlined, especially compared to Unity, and it was highly customizable. However, despite this early promise, Stingray's overall market penetration remained modest. It never witnessed the overall adoption, seen with Unity and Unreal Engine. Many game developers were hesitant to switch from the engines that they have already been using for years. So over 2016 and 2017, Stingray struggled to grow its user base beyond Autodesk-centric studios. While it was included at no extra cost with Maya LT, which was a sneaky move to entice smaller teams, there was little evidence it was widely used by the community, I mean the community of game developers. Within two years of the launch, it became apparent that Stingray was not on track to seriously challenge the Unity and Unreal, I mean in terms of community size and the share in the game development industry. This lukewarm adoption set the stage for Autodesk's reevaluation of the engine's future, because Autodesk usually wants big sharks to attack and take over parts of the industry, and this game engine wasn't doing that. By late 2017, Autodesk had to recon with Stingray's underperformance in a very competitive game engine market, and the company made the decision to pull back rather than continue pouring resources into an uphill battle. Autodesk realized that the majority of game developers, I mean its customers, in addition to those in VR and AR content creation, had settled for Unity and Unreal as they are tools of choice. They even said it themselves, when bluntly stated, our customers are increasingly standardizing on two game engines, Unity and Unreal, for both games and VR and AR authoring. 
we feel we can better serve our customers by working more closely with Unity and Unreal rather than trying to develop our own alternative. In other words, Autodesk didn't see that they can push their game engine to the masses. I think that even though Autodesk is well established as a software company, they may have underestimated the inertia of established tools and the importance of things like a free community edition because they only think about monetization. And here is the thing. The decision not to offer a free version or source access, while logical from a revenue standpoint, most likely massively held their game engine's growth early on. And I personally think they should have learned from the experience of Crytek, who also competed using CryEngine with Unity and Unreal, but they failed. Around the same time, Autodesk as a whole was going through a major shift to a subscription-only business model for all its software. So in late 2017, the company announced layoffs of roughly 13% of its workforce to streamline operations, you know, for this kind of transition. They actually did more than that. They went on a purge. So they discontinued several game metaware products in mid-2017, including Scaleform, Beast, Human IK, and Navigation, which were all part of the game tool suite. This tells us one thing. Autodesk was offloading non-core products that didn't show strong revenue. String Gray being a relatively new venture without a strong revenue stream, well, it fell into that category. You see, instead of competing with Unity and Unreal, Autodesk chose to join them. In October 2017, Autodesk and Unity announced a collaboration to improve interoperability. Autodesk gave Unity source code access to its 3D format SDKs, enabling one-click asset workflows between Autodesk software and Unity. Unity even had a prominent presence at Autodesk's own user conference the same year. I think that Autodesk made the smart choice here, which in the end benefited everyone. Maybe not string great game developers, but most importantly, game developers who use Unity and Unreal, because they got better integration with 3D animation and asset creation software, whether it be Max or Maya, and maybe other software as well. Autodesk tried to get into the game engine market, but I would say it was unlucky, and here is why. The game engine market in the mid-2010s was consolidating around a few big players, and Unreal Engine's Ford decision in 2015 to go free, with royalties of course, and Unity's free tier had essentially locked in a generation of game developers, and String Gray entered just as the wave crested which in hindsight was an unfortunate timing. One might argue that Autodesk's misstep was not entering the game race sooner, for example several years earlier, when Unity was in its infancy and Unreal was still expensive. This, or maybe, not committing to a longer term fight. Anyways, by 2017, it was clear that fighting against Unity and Unreal would require a monumental effort that Autodesk likely did not see as justified. In the end, Autodesk officially announced the end of life for String Gray in December 2017. They stated that sales and development would cease as January 7th of 2018, and no further updates would be released beyond version 1.9. The decision was framed in terms of serving customers via third-party engine support, effectively admitting that Autodesk officially failed in the game engine race. But this wasn't the case because of timing, competition, or market changes only. Autodesk isn't innocent here, because they didn't read the room of game engines, and what was going on in the game engine market. They were only thinking about monetization first, in a market that was just about to offer almost everything for free. And I personally don't know how they missed that. And there you have it guys. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Also, please subscribe to the channel to receive more videos like this. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.